Good morning, fellow believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's great to come together, to be refreshed in spirit by the Lord, lifted to heavenly places in the Lord, and built together to be stronger as a temple for the Lord, to give glory to him. So this morning we're going to start off the 10,000 reasons why we're here this morning.
Thank you, Heavenly Father, for calling us to be part of your great family. And we ask that you be with all your family, wherever they be in this world today. Lift them up, refresh them in spirit. Allow them to come and worship your holy name. Give you thanks and praise for all that you have done for them and what you have to offer for them in this life. To lift their vision beyond the position that they see themselves in. Please be with them and please be with us this morning. Refresh our spirit to be more akin with your spirit. To your praise and glory. Amen. Thanks, Lucy. Everybody, good morning. Welcome to South Adelaide today. Lots of visitors. We have with us John and Maureen Eakins, uh, various glasses. We've got Joan and Jeff and Loris and Jake, David Herman, David Burney, Rob and Lois Scott, Faye Berry, and Izzy Fothers. And that's the last time you get announced as a visitor, because next Saturday, come along here to the hall to celebrate Izzy's baptism. It'll be starting at 2 p.m., so be here for that. You know it's going to be wonderful. And we'll have an afternoon tea afterwards, so please, uh, please bring along something to contribute towards that. Now, our prayer people for the week are Peter and Colleen Roberts. And just a heads up, uh, next year, the 14th of January, we're having new floors put down in this building. So on Sunday the 13th, we'd like to ask everyone after the meeting to just hang back for about 20 minutes if you can, to help move some furniture. You just need to move a few things out the way so the floors can go down on Monday the 14th. Now, uh, just a reminder, Bible class is in recess until mid-January. And the plans for next Sunday, we have to chair Simon Brederick, to exhort John Davey, a musician Greg Stone, and flowers, bread and wine, Ros Dunn. And so we'll have our collection now for general ecclesial funds. Thank you. great time of the year, particularly when we can sing together Joy to the World, Praise the Lord, 69.
Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come this morning with many and varied things on our minds and in our hearts, but in all of our petition, remind us that it's actually not about us, it's about you and the praise of your glory. And when we think that we, to, who, who were once separate and excluded and without hope in the world, we who once were far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. We who were once not a people are now a people. We who were called the uncircumcised, we now belong in the family. And this is a truly amazing blessing, Father. Brought about entirely by your grace. What a, what a privilege. We pray that you would give us a greater appreciation of this grace. This grace in which we stand. This building of people in which we, of which we are a part. This organic structure built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. Help us to prize this legacy, Father, to value and treasure it as, so that we can pass it on to those in our trust and to a new generation in a healthy and vibrant condition. And so in putting first things first, we acknowledge your supremacy in all things throughout the universe. And the fact that you have given all power and authority to Jesus, our Lord, in all things, in heaven and on earth. Fill us with a sense of awe and reverential fear whenever we pray and indeed whenever we engage in the things of the Spirit. Lift our gaze above the ordinariness of daily life. To appreciate that the things of the flesh, the things of this world are passing away. Give us a proper perspective of our place in eternity. So that as time passes, we will each find the things of the earth to grow strangely dim. In the light of your glory and grace. Remind us in our fellowship this day that we need to cooperate with you in the great salvation process that we need to be ready, willing and available to you if you are to work in us to will and to do of your good pleasure Father we are willing but sometimes an element of unwillingness creeps in uninvited so please help our unwillingness prune us when necessary so that we may be fruitful in your service producing the fruit that only your spirit can generate. Forgive our foolish ways and purge our consciences so that we can know deep down in our spirits that we really are forgiven so that we can live freely and confidently before you as you intended and as you have provided in the new covenant that we celebrate. In this week especially when there is isolation and loneliness as indeed there will be for many, we pray that you would minister the joy of belonging and the inclusiveness of family fellowship that comes through the gospel. Where there is doubt and uncertainty, may you work your reassurance and confidence. Where there is distraction and inattention, Please work your focus and discipline and when and where it suits you, may we be ready and willing for you to minister these things through us. We honour our prayer people, Peter and Colleen, in the congregation this morning. We place them before you. So appreciative of their respective ministries among us as elders, Peter in his work as treasurer and Colleen in her extensive counselling. Bless them this week and bless their work in the Lord. And we ask you too for a special blessing on their family spread so far and wide as they are this week. Bind them together in love this week especially. We pray for Izzy 
this week as she prepares for her baptism. May she come to rely on you for all the resources she will need to be a faithful and fruitful disciple. And may we, her brothers and sisters, learn to serve her and mentor her in a sensitive and caring, appropriate manner. For those of our members whom we see infrequently, and sadly there are some of those, may their hearts turn to you this week as they with all of us reflect on the coming of their Saviour. May they be reminded of the value of their service in the body and of the love that you have for them. Comfort them in the knowledge that you have them in hand even to the extent of having counted the hairs on their head. And shortly as we remember you, Lord Jesus, in the sacraments, draw us closer to the reality of our calling and of the immense privilege and responsibility we have of being servants of the King, children of the Father, instill in us a proper sense of spiritual priority and an urgency about our service. In the meantime then, Father, keep us in your love. Keep us from stumbling. Equip us with everything necessary for doing your will and, and uh, may you work in us what is pleasing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. John's asked that Ephesians 2 be the basis of our words of encouragement this morning and Kay will come forward and read that for us. Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were, were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this, this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who, who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the province, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace 
to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We'll be led in thought by John this morning. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone. That's a bit surprising, isn't it? I speak them and I speak back. We're really happy to be here. Thanks for inviting us. The four most important events in the whole world through history are before us. Three of them have been fulfilled and one is still to come. And this is what they are. The first one, the birth of Christ. The second, his crucifixion. The third, his resurrection. And the fourth, his return to earth. We come to remember Christ's crucifixion and resurrection each Sunday as he asked us to. We look forward to his return in our prayers daily. Let's celebrate his birth this week. It's an excellent time for personal preaching. Sure, it's probably the wrong time of the year. The origins may be questionable. But when I went yesterday into a Jewish-owned shopping centre and heard the carol, Hark the Herald Angels Singing, it made me feel it's right that we should talk about Jesus' birth, we should celebrate it, we should do preaching. And gifts are okay too, because there was gold, myrrh and, inc and um, frankincense. And my children ask me, Dad, what do you want for Christmas? And I never know, so I usually say either bright socks or a nice tie. But this year, I knew I needed a ball hanging from the garage, so when I drive the car and I know how far to go. So Paul rang me from Sydney and said, what do you want, Dad? I said, oh, a ball hanging from the ceiling. Oh, great. I told Maureen, she said, you told me that too, so I've got to have two balls. <laughs> <coughs> but there's something that we probably don't think about very often, and that is before Jesus was born, faithful people, people, were looking forward to his birth, even as we look forward to his return today. It was a huge event that the world was waiting for. And for you, Izzy, when you go to talk to people, one of the things I always remember, the very first verse in the New Testament simply says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And that's a really good clue because right through the scriptures, the coming of Jesus was foretold. Back in Genesis, when Abraham showed faith, God said, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So that was the first real solid promise that there was going to be a great blessing on earth. To David he said, I will establish his throne forever, speaking of his seed to come. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. So those two old people in the old, they weren't old always, but in the Old Testament, 
um, are the links where you see Ma Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 1, sums it up. Now, at the time when Jesus was born, there was quite a few people who were obviously looking for his birth. Zechariah, filled with the Spirit, the father of John the Baptist, said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham. How about Simeon, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple? It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. He was definitely waiting. And moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, that's us, and the glory of your people Israel. And Anna, that lady who lived in the temple for a long time, it's interesting to see she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So there was a lot of people waiting for Jesus to be born. When Mary was approached by the angel, she said, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. So there we have it, lots of uh, quotes about the birth of Jesus being looked forward to in that time and I think it's good for us to remember it this week for all the right reasons. Now what I want to talk to you about besides that this morning is the subject of grace. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Beautiful words. Do you feel included in that lovely description of being referred to as children of God? Is that how you feel, my dear brother, my dear sister? It's not unreasonable to ask ourselves the question, will I be accepted by Jesus when he comes? Our questions go something like this. Have I done enough? Have I been sinless? The answer to both these questions is a resounding no. You will never do enough or be righteous enough to earn a place in the coming kingdom on earth. But take heart. Remember, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. There are many verses in the Bible which tell us to be confident. Here are two from Isaiah. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And another one. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. We don't have the wherewithal to earn our salvation, but God is offering it to us without money and without cost. 
So this morning I want to consider together the three pillars of our salvation, which I think are faith, deeds and grace. But mainly let's focus on grace. We need to be confident of our place in the kingdom with humility and thankfulness. Let's start off with faith. After Abraham and Sarah had left Ur for 15 years, Abraham questioned God. God, you still haven't given me an heir, which was part of the promise. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And the next verse is one of the most famous verses in scripture and relates very closely to our salvation. It simply says, Abram believed and he credited it to him as righteousness. When you go through that beautiful chapter of faith in Hebrews 11, the thing that strikes me is when God said go, they went. Quite simple, most of it. When God said go, they went. If you'll come with me to Romans chapter 4, we'll see a little more of Abraham's faith. Starting at verse 1. What shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. So that's faith for you. The second pillar is about deeds or works, if you like. Now, some Christians might suggest that once you have faith in God's promises, you have no need to make any further effort because, after all, none of us is good enough to earn a place in the kingdom. So why should we worry to exert ourselves for working for Christ? But I think you'll agree with me, we can prove that's really wrong. In the letters that Jesus wrote to the ecclesias in early Revelation, nine times he makes direct comment about the believer's deeds or lack of them. Later in Revelation in chapter 20, the sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what they had done. Chapter 22 and verse 12, look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Sure, James, the Lord's brother, gave us some very practical advice about faith and works in James chapter 2. If you want to turn it up, it's, it's a very um, pivotal sort of discussion that's gone on through centuries with Christians disputing about whether faith and works go together. James chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? And here's the wrap. In the same way, faith by itself, it, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And down in tw verse 22, you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete 
by what he did. And in verse 24, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. It's mighty obvious that faith coupled with deeds is pivotal to our salvation. And the interesting thing is that both faith and deeds are things we have to do. They are our initiatives. It's up to us. So what deeds can we do? Well, all sorts, in and out of the ecclesia. We have an elderly sister at Adelaide who comes in regularly to straighten the chairs in the hall. No one's asked her to do it. She comes in every week and she simply says, it's my work for the Lord. But even when we have faith and deeds, we are still not able to earn salvation. And that's where grace comes in, where we rely on the generosity of God's grace to save us. So what is grace and can we have it now or is it something for the future? A very simple understanding is that grace is a gift from God a gift we don't deserve. And the following couple of quotes tell us that grace is active now and in the future. When Jesus was a young boy, less than 12 years old, we read, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. In Acts chapter 4, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. The fact that Jesus gave his life on the cross for us comes through most powerfully in quotes about grace. Come with me to Romans chapter 5. Commencing at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Down to verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Verse 17. For if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reign through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? In verse 20, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's a beautiful affirming quote in Hebrews 11. Sorry, it's not Hebrews 11, it's Hebrews 4. You'll all know it. You could probably say it without me reading it. Therefore... Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, 
just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Quite beautiful, isn't it? Just as an aside, Maureen and I visited a sister at Beth Salem last week, a beautiful sister, quite old, and she said, I'm not sure whether Jesus will accept me into the kingdom. She said, I haven't done all that much wrong. I thought that was pretty good. Um, but she said, I'm not sure that I've done enough. And this is the problem, and this is not uncommon. It's to accept God's grace, which is the really important thing, if we have the faith and if we've showed it in our lives by action. So let's come to our reading in Ephesians 2. At verse 4, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Here it is again. It is by grace you have been saved, a gift of God. In verse 7, In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Verse 10, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know that in almost every letter written by the Apostle Paul, he begins by extending grace and peace to his readers. I'd never thought much about why Paul joined those two words together, grace and peace. Sure, I suppose I understood grace. But I was talking with a brother last week whose father had died not long before. And the father had said to this man, I know I am dying, I am not afraid, I am at peace. It hit me quite strongly. We might have faith, we might have worked for the Lord, we know we're still not good enough on our own, but when we understand that God's grace is a gift from God which we have not earned, we should be overcome with thankfulness and humility, secure in the love of God and at peace. I now see why Paul used these two words together, grace and peace to you. Understanding God's grace will give us peace. The take-home message today which I don't probably need to repeat, you've probably all got it. The message is we must have faith that God can and will fulfil his promises. Our faith must result in us having the desire to work for the Lord, which is demonstrated by our deeds. These two pillars, remember, are our responsibility to build. They're for us to develop faith and to put it into work with deeds but even with faith and deeds we cannot earn salvation we still fail we are saved by God's grace that third pillar of our salvation it's a gift we cannot earn but with God's grace we can approach the throne of grace with confidence humility and thankfulness so, my dear brethren and sisters, please remember the three pillars of our salvation are faith, which is for us to have, deeds, which is for us to do, and grace, which is a gift from our Heavenly Father, a gift we don't deserve. And the key verse this morning, for it is by grace you have been saved 
through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And the very last verses of the Bible, a message from our Lord Jesus who we come to remember now. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Thank you, John. We come to remember the the gift of grace given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to remember how deep our Father's love is for us, that his plan was such that we were included by his grace. How deep the Father's love for us. Praise the Lord, 177. come to remember 
our Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done individually for all of us. He's given us life. He says to us also, he offers to us living bread, the grace of living bread in everyday life. So his death and resurrection and how we remember his whole ministry comes to us also with living bread each day for us to eat and live to his glory. Ron will give thanks for the bread. So, Heavenly Father, we humbly come before your throne of grace. We stand not by our strength, but by you living in us. We're no longer orphans, but a part of the family of God. We don't have to worry about earning salvation for your say that grace has saved us in Jesus. So Lord, help us to live in you. Help us never to be self-centred. Help us to follow the Master, who, because of the love for the Father, gave all so help us to relinquish our lives into your hands, knowing that we can completely trust in your love for each one of us. So we come seeing how Jesus lived his life, an example for all of us. And we thank you for this bread of life. And we ask for all thanks in Jesus. Amen. Jesus passed the bread to those that were with him at the time and said, eat this in remembrance of him. In the fullness of his name, remember him.
Let us give thanks for the wine. Heavenly Father, thank you for including us as part of your plan. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving us this reminder, the great cost that you paid so that we might have life, might receive grace from our Heavenly Father through you. We thank you for it. And oft when we think about it, Lord Jesus, what you went through, the giving of your life, shedding of your blood, often leaves us speechless that this was your Father's way that we might have life and experience the grace of our Heavenly Father. Thank you for this regular reminder. May it be life-changing for us, to your praise and glory and your Father. Amen. And he shared the wine with them also in remembrance When Jesus was born, there was great rejoicing in the heavens, singing and rejoicing. A new beginning was seen. And we sing of it this morning, and hark the herald angels sing our new beginning with the Lord Jesus Christ's birth and what he offers in his life to us.
Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, once again we reflect on that great gift, the gift of your Son for mankind. And we have faith, Heavenly Father. We have a fellowship of faith here today. Faith in your righteousness, your holiness, your love, your compassion for each one of us. Faith that you'll be gracious to each one of us, that we'll be forgiven. And as we trust in that grace and the forgiveness that you have extended to us, we pray that out of the power of that grace, we might live lives that are fit, fit to be children of the Son of the Most High. Father, be with us as we leave this place this morning, that we might carry in our hearts the joy of that grace. We come in Jesus' name.